Hey, welcome to NASA Launchpad. I'm your host, Vince Whitfield. You remember us talking about cryogenics with aerospace engineer Rob Boyle here on Launchpad, right? On that episode, we focused on the use of cryogenics in transport systems. But Rob wanted us to let you know that his primary area of focus has been in a different area of cryogenics. Most of the work I've done here at Goddard has been uh, the use of cryogenics for, for Earth science and space science applications. Detectors that we use for, for looking at the world, particularly in the infrared wavelengths, um, need to be operated cold, uh, liquid nitrogen temperature and below. At those temperatures, they have higher sensitivity, lower noise, and uh, they don't suffer from the, the glow that you would have from the, the, the thermal background. You can sort of imagine something that's been stuck in a fire glowing red hot. Well, it turns out that everything is, is glowing. Your eyes aren't sensitive to the longer wavelengths that you get from room temperature objects or te even objects that are below room temperature, but they're still glowing and they get in the way of the science. So, when we're talking about cryogenics, we're talking about really cold temperatures. But how cold are we really talking? I mean, I get chills when it's 13 degrees Celsius outside. That's 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's Rob again to help put it into perspective. It, in trying to explain to my kids what it is that I'm doing at work, I talk about the, uh, the, the temperatures that, that we're operating at. And that it's not only cold, but it's really, really cold. That the, uh, the hardware that we run would not only um, be colder than the North Pole and freeze the air at the North Pole. The, the, the gases that we have at room temperature, if you start to cool them down, the, uh, the molecules in those gases move more and more slowly until at a, a temperature that we um, refer to as absolute zero, the atoms in the gas stop moving. As the, uh, the gas gets colder and colder, it condenses, and what we see at uh, temperatures that are 70 or 80 Kelvin is uh, um, oxygen becoming a liquid at 77 Kelvin, liquid nitrogen starting to form. And at temperatures down around 25 Kelvin, we have liquid hydrogen. Um, the, the very lowest temperature liquid, liquid helium, wasn't actually produced until 1905 thereabouts and was a, a major triumph of science to be able to get something that low in temperature. The, uh, the absolute temperature scale is something that helps us understand what's going on with the, uh, the, the physical processes that we're working on and has provided a, a very good model for um, how the, uh, the, the, the motion of the individual atoms affects the, the global properties of the, the materials. Brr, gives me chills just thinking about it. Rob was talking about the Kelvin scale. Now, that might sound intimidating to you, but all you really need to know is that it's just another unit for measuring temperature, just like Celsius or Fahrenheit. The Kelvin scale is based on the kinetic energy of an object. Kelvin is based around absolute zero, which also translates to around negative 273 degrees Celsius and about negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Absolute zero is the coldest temperature theoretically possible and cannot be reached by artificial or natural means. The only real difference is that Kelvin units are not referred to as degrees. Let us Kelvin. A temperature change of one Kelvin equals a temperature change of one degree Celsius. So the two scales are very similar, but they start at different points. So anyway, cryogenics can be used in science applications. But what about a specific example? One of the things that we have in test in the lab right now is a set of uh, micro shutters for the James Webb Space Telescope. The micro shutters allow scientists to mask off parts of a scene, in this case, a uh, it, it might be a, a field of galaxies at, at very high magnification, very long wavelength, and allows them to um, pick out individual galaxies in a scene and measure the spectrum of light that's coming off of that, uh, that individual galaxy. The micro shutters are something that were developed here at Goddard to allow one of the James Webb Space Telescope instruments to, uh, to perform uh, multi-optic spectroscopy. Um, it, 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 allows the, the spacecraft to operate more effectively over its lifetime, um, doing much more science in the same amount of time. And again, I bet you're probably itching to know how cryogenics can possibly affect you. Well, you don't have to look any further than a hospital. One of the most common encounters between um, the average citizen and cryogenics is when they have an injury. If you have a knee injury, you go in for an MRI and you're actually sitting inside of a, a superconducting magnet with a cryogenic refrigerator. That, that very intense magnetic field um, allows us to probe the structure of the body with special, uh, special detectors called squids. 
um, superconducting quantum interference devices that are very, very sensitive to minute changes in magnetic field. So by um, pulsing the magnetic field in, the, uh, in, in your body, you can actually then look at the reaction of the individual molecules and map out the distribution of soft tissue in your knee or in your elbow. Um, you can look at brain structure, you can look at uh, brain activity and understand a lot of what's going on in the human body. It's a, an application of cryogenics that um, isn't very obvious. You can sort of hear the noises in the background when you're sitting in the doctor's office, but don't realize that there's something that's at four Kelvin sitting right next to you. Just to be clear, NASA did not invent MRI technology, but it has contributed to its advances over the years. That's NASA for you, from peering way out into other galaxies to helping peer into our bodies. That's all the time we've got for now. Thanks for watching. For NASA Launchpad, I'm Vince Whitfield, and we'll catch you next time.